wanted to, to just remind you guys of one thing from Canvas um, because you'll need to finish this up over the weekend. So the there's modules here that are called fourth hour. You can ignore what the fourth hour, like that's just a designation that we have to do for accreditation. But um, every week, basically, I've picked out a couple of retro games to play and either readings or videos or something to go with it on either video game history or some social stuff that relates to it or it just whatever seemed relevant. Um, and I didn't figure it would be too hard to, to convince you guys to play some games as your homework or part of your homework, right? That seems pretty reasonable. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I've divided up the, the seven weeks of the class into basically seven different eras within sort of retro game, marching from sort of the late 70s up to the now early to mid 90s, roughly speaking. Um, it's not a, certainly a complete history of video games, but it's enough to, to kind of get a little bit of a sense of the different, you know, the, the evolution of things. Um, so uh, basically to play all this stuff um, with uh, with one exception that, that'll happen later in the semester, um, you'll play this stuff down in the game lab in the library. So do you guys all know where that is? Yeah, down in the basement of the library. Um, so it's on the, I guess, north end of the library. There's a bunch of TVs and a big, like, circular couch-looking thing. Um, just walk around the basement, you'll find it. It's not, you know, a maze. Um, so um, anyway, this week is arcade stuff, right? So sort of the early history. Um, and uh, so I bought an arcade machine. Um, it's not like a, an original, it's sort of a modern reproduction. So it has an LCD screen instead of one of those big tube TVs that they used to have, um, it, which was fortunate because tube TVs, I don't know if you guys have ever had to try and carry one. They are heavy, my goodness. So uh, the last time I had to haul one around was, um, oh, this is probably about 10 years ago. Dr. Blix's TV at his, his apartment died, and it was one of these massive old tube TVs. And, of course, you know, you can't get these things fixed nowadays. And so we went to the store and bought him a flat screen TV, and he's all happy, and it takes up so much less space. And then I have to figure out, how the hell am I going to get rid of this old TV? So... It sat in my garage for a month until I could figure out what to do with it. Um, but yeah, so uh, it, it's a modern reproduction. So it's like about a three-quarter scale of what a real arcade machine would have been, um, which made it a little bit easier to put the thing together. Um, anyway, so on it, uh, it, it's already on, right? We just basically are leaving it on. Uh, it has like 12 or so games. It's like six Pac-Man variants. Uh, it's got Galaga and Galaxian, which are uh, one's a sequel to the other, uh, and then a few other things. Um, and it's kind of cool because it's internet connected for high score tracking, so you can see like how you rate compared to uh, Mr. Prison. Huh? A snow delay? Yeah. It takes you just as long to trudge over here from, from the house, snow or non, no snow. And you didn't even bring me a sandwich. To... Oh, you brought a banana. Okay, well. Uh, all right, well, I see how it is. All right, so anyway, what I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted um, was uh, the the arcade machine uh, has, you know, various games on it. You're free to play whatever you want on it, but specifically for the class, I want you guys to play Pac-Man and Galaxian. Um, and, uh, I mean, how many of you guys have played classic Pac-Man before? Right. Okay. I mean, that one's kind of a classic. Everybody's played that. And what about Galaga or Galaxian? Before, like, before this class started? Really? Where? Like, in arcades? Back when you were kids? Or, or emulator stuff? Well, just because they're 
Yeah, but just because they're there doesn't mean that you actually play them and that you go and play like Street Fighter or. Uh, Okay, well, um, I, color me surprised because I didn't figure that you guys nowadays, you kids these days, would have played that. Um, so anyway, in this case, I guess you get to relive some old memories, right? Um, but it's more than just playing these. So each of the assignments on Canvas, you know, the ones that are in the fourth hour category, are also linked to a discussion board thing. So you're going to play or watch or, or read, you know, as the, uh, the, the, the individual assignments indicate. But then there's the discussion board, right? And I've set it up so you can't see anybody else's post until you've posted yourself. And you can also reply to posts and stuff like that, right? So basically, I want to have like a, well, discussion about what are the things in the games that you liked, what were the, you know, were the controls annoying? Were they fun? Were they, was there some clever mechanic that's giving you an idea for things that you're going to program later on your own, right? That's the kind of, of thing we want. Not super long. I mean, I'm not asking for like four page papers here, right? But reasonable discussion posts. So, um, and uh, hopefully through this process, you guys will think about not just the game from, you know, like, and I guess this is one difference, right? When you played uh, Pac-Man or whatever in the arcade, you were just playing a game, right? And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But with this, I want you to play the game and also think about the game, right? Think about the mechanics. Think about the game design. Think about it from the, the standpoint of you're going to be programming things like this, okay? Now, it won't be like we can't reprogram exactly Pac-Man with the make code thing, but we can get stuff that kind of looks and feels like it. Um, one of the limitations that we have is the screen size. Uh, so like we could program ex the entire Pac-Man, like we could literally clone the game. The only difference is you'd only be able to see like part of the game screen at any given time. You wouldn't be able to see the entire thing. Um, but with that, you know, minor exception, we can, we can do anything of these sorts of old games. Okay. Um, all right, so does that kind of make sense? All right, so next week, and we'll talk about this Monday um, <clears throat> in a little bit more detail, we'll move on to the Atari era, which is, you know, one of the, not the first, but one of the early home video consoles that you would have connected to a TV, and it had cartridges, and you'd plug the cartridges in and turn it on, and it would play that game, and... Um, um, you know, with the joystick or whatever other little controller. Um, and, uh, you know, then the, the next week is the 8-bit Nintendo and then some old school computer stuff. And then um, I think Game Boy is after that. And then the Super Nintendo era and Genesis. Um, and then the final week is sort of modern throwbacks to uh, retro games, um, of which I would include the Make Code platform because it's designed with that retro sort of look and feel as, as it's shtick, if you will. Um, okay, good. Please. All right. So let's start programming something. Um, so if you go to make code, uh, make code dot Microsoft dot com or, uh, or arcade dot make code dot com will get you straight to it. Um, then, um, up at the top, right, it'll have a little thing to sign in. Um, and if you just sign in with your Wabash, so sign in and then it'll say like connect to Microsoft or Google or whatever, you can connect to Microsoft and that way it'll tie it to your Wabash email because we use the Microsoft uh, login stuff for that. Um, and this way it'll save your stuff. If you aren't logged in, it will save it in browser cache history basically, but then it only is on that machine that you work on. Whereas, of course, if you sign in, you can access it from any computer where you're signed in, and then you won't lose stuff. Um, okay, so it's got a bunch of uh, tutorials um, that, you know, and some of these are, are kind of designed for kids. But um, so we'll, we'll just start with a new project instead of doing an actual tutorial, um, at least today, and uh, just start making just a really silly little simple game that 
is going to be super lame from a gameplay standpoint, but then we'll just keep adding things to it and in the process start to see, um, A, what sort of the game design philosophy is, how you do development, um, but then also we'll, we'll kind of get more and more advanced with the programming. So I'm just going to make a new project and I'm going to call it uh, example one, whatever. And then if you click under code options, basically probably always have it under blocks, JavaScript and Python, as opposed to Python or JavaScript only um, to start because the blocks is what um, you guys will use for not all of the class, but most of it. Um, uh, particularly for those of you who have never programmed before, right? B that's the whole point of block-based stuff. Okay, so um, when you open it up, a blank project, you, you basically have a blank code window here, and there's not much, uh, but there is always an on-start block. And any code that we put inside this little um, notch will run only once, and it'll run when the program starts up. Okay, so for example, that's going to be the place where you put um, things that only need to run at the very beginning of uh, the program execution. Uh, for the purposes of a game, for example, that could be things like setting the number of lives, setting the health of the player, uh, setting the point count to zero, you know, things like that that would happen at the very beginning. But it's only going to execute once. Okay, so um, so for example, let's do that, say the score, right? And uh, we can do, for example, um, let's see, where do I want it? Uh, I think it's under info. Yeah, here it is. Set score to zero. So score is a variable that is sort of predefined in make code. Um, because, well, it's designed for making games, so of course there should be a score variable. We don't have to create that variable specific to us. Um, we can create other variables to keep track of other things, but for right now we'll just use the, the built-in score variable, nothing, um, nothing special. Okay, so when we run the game, and over here in the window, uh, you've got basically a preview, so if you hit the play button, it will run the game or run the program. And right now, all it does is set the score to zero, which is automatically displayed at the top right corner. There's ways that we can change that, but uh, that's the default, right? Um, okay, well, great. That's not in anything exciting, right? Um, but how the game will work is essentially a game is, a, um, is just a giant loop, Right? And if you think about when we played Uno last time, or if, well, really any card game or something like that you play, like, say, or, or a board game like Monopoly, right? Monopoly is a giant loop. What happens during the loop? Well, somebody rolls the dice, and then they move however many spaces, and then they land on something. And then what do you have to check when they land on a space? Yeah, is it unowned or is it owned? And if it's unowned, then you can buy it if you have enough money and you choose to. If it's owned, then you have to pay rent to whoever owns it, and you calculate that based on, well, what tile is it, you know, because the properties are worth more as you go along the game board. Yes, you can do multiplayer stuff, um, which we'll get to later because it requires some complicated stuff. But um, anyway, um, the uh, um, but then you have to like you know count up how many houses or hotels or whatever are on the thing, and uh, you guys have played Monopoly, right? Okay, so then you move on to the next person's turn and the next person's turn, and the game basically just continues in this loop until such time as somebody has won, right? And in Monopoly, that happens basically if you're the last person standing. Um, <clears throat> so g video games are basically like this in the sense that most of the things that are going to happen 
in the game are going to happen in basically a loop that's running continually over and over again. And in particular, like what we'll do just as a, a, a cheesy example is let's just get a thing on the screen so that we can move it around, right? Like a, a Pac-Man looking character that we can move up, down, left, and right. Well, every, um, uh, uh, we basically need to be checking, have I, uh, c continually, am I pressing a button, right? And if so, what do we do? Now, MakeCode has a nice thing here, basically called move my sprite with buttons. Now, we'll have to create the sprite, and I'll talk about that is, is, in a second. Um, and uh, so we don't have to necessarily be quite as detailed as doing something like, when you press the up button, what should the object do? Move up, right? And if you press the down button, go down and so on, okay? So, um, and, and actually, let's just use that for right now, just for sake of demonstration. So this event, okay, so um, will trigger only when the up button is actually pressed. Okay, and well, what should trigger if the up button is pressed? Yeah, okay, but in order to have the character move up, we first need a character, right? We need something on the screen, okay? And that, like the setting the score, should go in the on start place because we need to create the existence of something. Okay, so sprites are the names for the objects that are going to be in the game. A sprite has some properties attached to it, okay? It can, uh, we can associate any data to the sprite that we want. So for example, health, uh, uh, in an inventory kind of system or something like that. Um, but it also has some art that goes with it. It doesn't have to have art that goes with it, but most of the time it should because you need to be able to see it. Um, and it also has a property called its kind. Um, in real Python, this is called basically a, a class structure, right? So you can have uh, this kind of object that is of class student and this kind of object that's of class teacher or whatever. And students have different properties and, and do different things than teachers do. Okay, fine. Same thing here, right? So I can have a class for objects that are players. I could have a class for objects that are enemies. I could have a class for power-ups and so on, okay? So like in Pac-Man, for example, what are the different objects that we would have? Or the different, okay, you've got the Pac-Man himself, right? Okay, so the player. You've got the, the little pellets that he's trying to eat all of them off the board. What else? Hmm? The fruit, which occasionally comes in, okay, uh, what else? Yeah, the power-up things, the big pellets that are at the corners that allow you to eat the ghosts rather than being eaten by the ghosts, okay? And then, of course, there's the ghosts. Um, and each of those things would be of a different category because what happens when you eat a pellet? Yeah, it goes away, and your score goes up by a point or whatever, right? But what happens when you eat a big pellet? Yeah, the ghosts change color. They start acting differently. Like normally the ghosts are chasing you. And when you eat the big pellet, they start running away. Um, and also now you can eat them, right? So it, sh but we would want the big pellet to be of a different object category than the little pellet because we want, the, because the behavior should be different, right? What happens when you eat a big pellet versus a fruit are different things, okay? Um, so for, um, for our game, we'll just have a start with a, um, just some sprite, okay? And where it says to sprite, and then it's got this blank of kind player, well, we can create as many different kinds as we want the four that are sort of default built in are player, projectile, food, and enemy. Again, because think about the kinds of games that you would be programming. 
right? Uh, food is just what they call power-ups, but, you know, whatever. It's just a main. Um, and then projectile would be, um, well, Galaga is maybe a better example of that, right, or Galaxian, right? What happens when you hit one of the buttons? It pew-pews, right? And that object that's moving, uh, we could call that a projectile sprite. And what happens when it runs into an enemy? It destroys it, okay? So collision, basically what happens when two things uh, come into contact will also be something we need to worry about. Now in Galaxian, actually, really we should say that there's two kinds of projectiles. What are, what, why would it be good to have two different kinds? Yeah, because the enemy can also shoot back at you, right? And what happens if the, an enemy shoots and it hits another enemy? Nothing, right? But if an enemy shoots and that projectile hits the player, then something should happen, right? So um, if we were making like, a, like imagine a version of Galaxian where the enemies can't shoot you, then you only need one category of projectile. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, you can rename or change the the different types, uh, but for for now we'll just go with player because that's what we're gonna to make. And then if you click this little gray thing, it'll open up a art editor um, and allow you to uh, uh, draw basically the the graphics for it. Um, the checkerboard. Uh, so everything is in pixels, and so they're really blown up here. Uh, the checkerboard part would be that a uh, transparency. Okay, so you would be able to see through the background. All right, now I suck at drawing, and um, it, it, of course, clicking here is is kind of annoying. Uh, you only get sixteen colors uh, in this this platform. That's one of its limitations. Um, but there are in the gallery a whole bunch of uh, art that's already um, basically ready to go that we can use. Okay, so for example. There's some cheesy food items, there's character, and notice that the character, um, there's lots of different poses and animations of it, so you can have it make it uh, look like he's walking around. Okay, there's ghosts, there's buttons, there's animals of a few kinds. Um, one second, there's sort of explosion-y looking things. There's things that look like power-ups. There's sort of a... Not quite a Pokemon, but totally a Pokemon, right? Um, and uh, then some some art that we can use for like building um, a game world. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Question. Yes. Yeah, you just have to kind of get down on the floor to get to it. Yeah. It's yeah. It's it's literally under the desk. Um, okay, so whatever. It doesn't matter what, what uh, art we pick here. Um, I'll just pick um, the, well, what looks good. I'll just pick this stupid little ghost. Okay, and then you can doctor it up if you want to, um, and you can name it something uh, if you want, uh, but we'll just go with that. Okay, so... Um, the sprite, when you create it, it defaults its position to, in this case, the beginning, or sorry, the middle of the screen. Yeah, which uh, the coordinate system we will have to talk about because uh, what would be logical to be the middle of the screen? Like its coordinates. Yeah, zero, zero would make sense, right? Like just like it is in math class. Um, however, in some computer graphics, um, actually the zero zero is the top left of the screen and you think, okay, that's silly. Um, and the X axis goes to the right. Okay. That makes sense. But then the Y axis actually goes down rather than up. So it's a left-handed coordinate system instead of a right-handed coordinate system. Now, the reason that that is the case, and it still is in modern computer graphics, um, is if you think about what computers were like in the 60s, where would you start putting text on a screen? At the top left, right? So it makes sense to put the origin there. And further, like when you're going down, 
like think of like an old typewriter, right? You're literally scrolling down the page to, to get to a new line. That's sort of the metaphor that early computing used. It was like a fancy typewriter, just without, you know, hammers and stuff. Um, okay, but um, even though that may be the, the, um, <clears throat> the way computer graphics works, as you guys can imagine, though, that's somewhat annoying to have to think about. And so in the case of make code, they've reprogrammed it basically so that it hides that detail from you. If you want to put something in the middle of the screen, we call it zero, zero, but back under the hood, it's putting it someplace else. Okay. So what about if I don't want it to be at the middle when it starts uh, the game? Well, how could I move it to a different position? without using the keyboard, right? We'll add that in too. Yeah, exactly. So under sprites, I can also set its position to something, okay? So I'll set its position to, and just for um, uh, sake of demonstration, right? Ah, but what did you notice here? Where is the origin? It is at the top left. So I lied to you guys, right? Um, so it puts it at the middle, which is um, the um, the screen here is basically 140 pixels, right? Or 160, sorry, by 120. So it's a four by three ratio, um, which is like what old school TVs and even your old Game Boy and stuff like that were, right? So it's not like 16 by 9 like or 16 by 10 like most modern TVs or computers, okay? Yeah. Sometimes. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, yeah, the order can matter but not always. So for example, could I put the set score at the beginning instead of at the end? Yeah, so some of those are, are independent, right? They're gonna be executed sequentially, but it doesn't matter if you set the score to zero before you create the character or after. Okay, however, <clears throat> I can't move a sprite to a place if it doesn't exist yet, right? So I have to first create the sprite and actually have it be part of the game world before I can move it to a place. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And it, the, uh, it, the, the sandwiching, right, you do have to think about the order because most of the time it's going to matter. For things that are sort of independent of each other, like the score versus creating the sprite, it doesn't matter. Um, but, uh, but in logic, right, some stuff will. Okay. And you said you had another question. JavaScript. Okay. So blocks is what we're looking at, right? Literally little blocks of code, like Legos or something, right? Well, no, this is what blocks look like. We just don't have a lot of blocks on here yet, right? I mean, we could have hundreds upon hundreds of these things. And if you make a full game, you're going to get up to that point, right? Where there's lots and lots of things here. Um, Python and JavaScript are text-based languages. There's no assembling blocks. You're just, it's just typing. That's it. Okay. Um... Well, let's see. Functionality-wise, no. What MakeCode does when you have blocks is it translates that stuff into actual code that the machine can run. And that's all hidden from you behind the scenes. Okay. Um, when you type in Python, there's still some translation that needs to happen, but maybe not as much. Um, okay, so yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense, if you're just programming in Python and completely separate from this MakeCode platform, okay? 
Um, all of the stuff that's sort of built in, like all this art, the, the sort of built-in functionality. Um, so maybe let me try and make a better analogy here. Um, let's take, say, a, a Spanish, right, as a language. Um, well, you can do different things with Spanish in different contexts, right? So Spanish is a language, and we could maybe sit around and read a novel, like we could read Don Quixote. Well, I couldn't. I can't read Spanish. Um, but we could sit around and we could do that, right? And that's one activity or one paradigm in which you could use Spanish. I could also go and get lunch at El Charo, right? And the context and the, the way in which I'm going to use the Spanish is different at El Charo versus if I'm sitting there arguing and reading about Don Quixote, okay? So Python is like Spanish in this instance, right? And, uh, and JavaScript, same idea. It's French instead of Spanish, okay? Um, <clears throat> within make code would be like doing the things that I would do at El Charo with my Spanish. And uh, if, so the built-in stuff here for, you know, doing button, checking whether or not buttons are pressed and things like that is not going to be relevant in other contexts of Python, Okay, where, where you might use Python, okay? So um, <clears throat> those of you who uh, are, you know, who are my freshmen and sophomores, say, in the room? Okay, so are you guys, any of you, interested in further computer science study? Yeah? Okay. So the course that would come after this is Intro Programming, and it's basically an entire semester of Python, right? Um, okay, the functional difference within make code basically none. Anything you can do in blocks, you can do in Python and vice versa. And same thing with JavaScript, okay? Um, the difference is how it looks, right? So if I, for example, take what we've already done and just click the Python button, it will translate all the blocks into their equivalent Python form uh, for me, okay? And uh, that's kind of useful for... Um, uh, well, later on in the course, when we start to transition to away from programming with blocks, uh, this will be clutch because it'll kind of help us in that translation layer, okay? No, you can do everything, right? I mean, because like, look, when the, okay, that you're going to realize the hard way Okay, and the reason is, how many blocks do I have in here? Not many, right? If I have a full game, I'm going to have hundreds upon hundreds of these. And it starts to get difficult to organize everything. Because then you'll be like, oh, where did I put the up button command? And you'll have to be scrolling around to find it, okay, in your, your window of code. And it'll just start to get kludgy. Okay, and that's when you would then transition to Python. Okay, because it's a lot easier to organize text. Um, I mean, you may, may still have to scroll to find something, but you also can then organize things a little bit differently. So, for example, where should you have the function that runs at the beginning, the on start? Probably somewhere up at the top. Okay, and then core functionality like how do you move the player or something would probably follow. So you could organize your stuff into chunks. Now, in real programming, you can't do this in make code. Um, in real programming, how many text files would you have that have code in them? You can have way more than one. Okay, for relatively small programs, you can do it all in just one file. Okay, but... Um, Let's say you have millions of lines of code. Okay, now we're not obviously going to create millions of lines of code. That's a little ridiculous, right? But if I were, would I have all million lines in one file? No. What I would do is start to modularize things and have, like, um, let's say, for example, in a game, right? I've got code that uh, is associated with the player. I've got code that's associated with enemies. Wouldn't it make sense to put those in two different files? 
right? Just from an organization standpoint. Yeah. And then you would have one main master file that basically uses things from all the other ones. Um, now in make code, you only have one file, right? It, there it is. Okay. Um, but we're also not going to be producing things with millions of lines of code. We're going to be producing things with hundreds of lines rather than millions. Okay. Um, so, but you'll notice, like, for example, the my sprite dot set position of zero, zero. Well, what is that doing? Well, what do you think it's doing? Setting the position of the thing to a particular spot. Okay. And then the numbers go in parentheses there in the same way that the numbers go in the little uh, bubble looking things when we're back in the block view. Okay. Um, now, with Python, hang on a second. Um, the syntax looks different. And what, so what do I mean by syntax is you see how there's parentheses and I have to keep track of the commas and there's dots and also things are, some of the things are tabbed over and all of that. You have to worry about that in Python. That's sort of a core part of the language in the same way that like when you're writing Spanish, you have to spell things correctly, right? Um, whereas in block mode, it's basically impossible to make what we call a syntax error, like is it possible for me to misspell the set score function? No, because it's already on a little block and I'm just dragging it over, okay? So from a, an education standpoint, this is why block-based coding is, is used with beginners because one of the things that beginner programmers find very frustrating with text-based coding is the syntax, right? Making these nitpicky little errors that your program doesn't run because you forgot a comma someplace. Well, if you're a n n novice, well, which you guys are, or let's say you're a kid, are you going to be excited about programming if like it yells at you every time you miss a comma and you're, nothing works? No, it's going to turn you off very quickly. And it's also going to impede your the actual learning that we're trying to do, which is how programming works. Right. So that's one of the advantages of the block based system um, is it 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 allows us to concentrate on one thing and not worry about the syntax part until you've got more skills under your belt and you're more um, cognitively ready for that step. OK. Uh, now, again, that that cognitive thing is maybe more appropriate for children. Um, you guys aren't kids. Right. So the, the way that you'll absorb this and the way that you're going to learn it is different than if I were to teach this to 10 year olds. Um, but the same tool is useful in both cases. OK, so does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Um, any other questions while I'm while we're on quest in question mode? No. OK, um, so if I set the sprites position to zero zero, where does it end up? Yeah, the top left of the screen, and we basically can't even see most of it because it's off the screen. Okay, so do I want it to be there? Probably not. Um, let me put it at 1010 instead and then rerun it. Well, okay, maybe that wasn't enough. Let's just put it there. Um, why is it not going to where I want it to be? Oh, okay. Uh, we'll deal with that later. Um, Uh, we might actually, yeah. So let's call this player sprite. And then let's set its position to that. Yeah, why is that not running? Okay, that's interesting. Um... I 
That's weird. Okay. Um, I'm not sure why that's happening, but, well, we'll run with it because what are we going to want to make the thing do? Eventually, we want it to move, right? So let's get in some code to actually make the thing move, and then to some extent where it starts is not important, okay? Um, okay, so um, we can use this move my sprite or the player sprite with buttons, okay? And if I change that, and then I have the option here to configure basically how fast can it move, and then, okay, well, something is weird here. Let's try debugging it here. Um, oh, there it goes. All right. Well, whatever. Um, let, let's start to get the thing to move, okay? So if I wanted to hit the up button, then what should happen if I hit the up button to the sprite? Yeah, we should move it up, okay? Which means that I'm going to change... Oh, it's because I didn't choose player sprite, that's why. I should change the Y coordinate by what? Okay, but... Which way does the coordinate system go? Yeah, so if I hit the up button, I actually want to change the Y coordinate by negative one, okay, or negative something. And the reason is because up is the negative direction on the Y axis, not the positive direction, right? Which is annoying, but get over it. Is that okay? Yeah? Yeah, JoJo. Okay, so if I run this, Right, and let me get rid of that um, just so it'll default to it being in the middle. Well, it should default to being in the middle. Oops, okay, there we go. Why is this not moving? Yeah, something is really messed up here. You know what, let me go out and come back in. Well, okay, one of the things I'm wondering is if it's actually, like, I'm using Safari here, and if if it really doesn't like Safari. Um, let's let's add a uh, one here for, um, if I hit right, then let's change the X by one. See, and nothing's happening there. I'm sorry? Uh, to go left, it would go with negative values, but to go right, it should be positive. Um, yeah, so the x-axis is the, the usual coordinate configuration. The y-axis is the one that's backwards, okay? And again, that's annoying, but... Um, and we are changing the player sprite, so... Okay, this is really messed up, guys. I don't know why. So yours works, right? Okay. Um, so you know what? Let me do this. Let me get out of there and let me go in and try it on. Are you, which browser are you using? Chrome. Okay. Let me let me try that. Maybe it just doesn't like Safari. Um, well, if Chrome will open. Okay. Chrome crashed. That's great. We're having a Monday, right? All right. Okay. I won't bother signing in right now. Um, we'll deal with that later. Okay, so let's just do everything that we did a second ago. So we had set the player sprite to um, 
our silly little skeleton. Okay, whatever. And where'd my mouse go? There it is. Okay. Um, and then that runs and it defaults to the middle. Okay. And then we can set its position to say zero, zero, which would be the top left. Okay. And then under controller, what do we have? So let's do on, uh, let me just do the down button for right now. Uh, so for the down button, we should change the Y coordinate by one, right? To go down one. And there it goes. Okay. So it, it must just be something with Safari is why it's messed up. Okay. Um, now, as we'll see with movement, um, it's actually better to use the other function to move something with buttons. Um, and the reason is because it's, it's smoother, right? So when I hit the down button, what do you guys notice? Yeah, it does. But if I hold the down button, what happens? It moves down once, right? One pixel. But then if I continue to hold the down button, does it continue to move? No. Okay. Um, and the reason is because what this block only gets triggered when the button is pressed, not when it's held or when it's released. However, we do have the ability to change the behavior a little bit. So um, you can run it when it's pressed or when it's released or when it's held. Okay. So in this case, let's try it with repeat and see what, what changes. Oops, and you have to click over on the game window. Okay, so then it does does move more continuously. Okay, um, but it's still you you still see how it was kind of jumpy. It wasn't quite continuous looking. Um, we can deal with that, but we'll have to deal with that later. Okay. Um, all right. Well, now that we figured out why you know my computer was cursed, um, yeah. Yeah, the curse of Safari. That's weird because I've used Safari for this like forever and it, I've never had these problems. So, okay. Um, anyway, so uh, I, we didn't quite get exactly where I wanted today, but that's okay. So basically what, what we'll continue with on Monday is getting the movement fully working, right? So that we can have the thing move in all the directions. Okay, we could also add in some something to keep the player from going off of the screen. Um, and then, well, we need a game, right? Right now we're just moving a thing around. Well, what would be maybe a good thing to add just simple? Okay, either some sort of enemies or let's just collect food, right? So let's, you know, in honor of Mr. Prusen, let's, have, let's make banana collector. You know, Robert's banana collector, 9,000 and one. Right, and what'll be the object of the game? Yeah, get all get as many bananas as you can. And what would maybe be a good mechanic for this? Well, we should start our character, and let's just have him start in the middle of the screen, or you know, it doesn't matter, right? Where should the banana be? Huh? Not in the middle, right? But where, what would be a good thing to do with the banana? Like, so let's say I connect, collect a banana. Should another banana appear? Where should it appear? Somewhere random, right? Let's add a randomness to this so that each time you collect a banana, a new banana appears, but it's somewhere else randomly generated on the screen, right? Well, that means that we can start doing some math. Um, because do we want it to be completely random? Well, to some extent, but what would be maybe a good thing? Because you could randomly, what, what could happen if, if we do it? Yeah, either far away enough from the last banana or um, far away enough from the player. Okay, now in this case, that would, those would be equivalent because a new banana is only going to appear when the player is collecting a previous banana. Okay. So we can mix having some randomness with already knowing where the previous banana is so that we don't like put a new banana right on top of the player uh, where 
uh, there already was another banana. If we make it fully random, that could happen, right? And at first, we'll, we'll just make it fully random, okay? Um, and what would the coordinates be? Well, what's the size of our screen? 160 by 120, right? And uh, you, did you guys notice when the skeleton was at the top left? Uh, when I put it at zero, zero, what about the skeleton was at zero, zero? His center, not his top left edge, right? So we will have to think about that so that we don't have stuff running off the screen, okay? All right, good? All right, so glad we sorted out that little technical problem. And I hope you guys have fun with Pac-Man and Galaxian. And, uh, you know, we can see who gets the high score each uh, each class. All right, see you guys later.